Welcome to the channel. Let's paint a spring flower together and practice the layering technique with watercolor. It's one of the most important skills you need if you want your watercolors to look realistic and it requires some patience and careful planning. I will break it down into three easy steps so you can take note of the different layers of light and shadow and take this learning forward to your next painting. I will explain my pigment choices and you may be surprised to find out why I'm actively avoiding ultramarine here even though the color totally fits and only last year I did a demo featuring a similar flower using ultramarine blue. A real-time recording of this tutorial will be available on my Patreon in three days along with black and white outlines or you can grab my reference photo in the video description below and practice with me right away. Let's get started with the first layer. I'm painting on Arches Cold Pressed. It's a 7 by 9 inches block, 140 pounds in thickness. And you can choose any paper, at least 50% cotton, so it can sustain the layers we're going to paint. We need two colors minimum, magenta and thylo blue. Mixed together, they will give you a gorgeous purple shade. And of course, you can simply use purple straight from the tube like I did. If you're feeling adventurous, you can also add a splash of opera pink here and there, but it's completely optional. In this first step, our goal is to create a very light, watery layer of purple color with some splashes of pink on the tips of each flower bulb. Try focusing on no more than two, three bulbs at a time. Cover them with purple or a mixture of blue and magenta and then add a tiny drop of pink one at a time. You can also drop some blue on the shadow areas, but be careful to keep the overall layer super light. Notice that in some cases I'm leaving some highlights completely blank. Pure white will serve as a highlight and I'm also adding a bit of opera pink closer to the highlights, but very lightly. Opera pink is a fugitive and granulating pigment. It will fade eventually, but for a few years, these splashes of pink will look super vibrant and make the overall painting pop in those places where I put it. As I move down the stem, my mixture is becoming slightly more saturated and I'm adding more blue splashes to indicate future areas of dark shadow. And yet overall, this layer is still very light and we can add a little bit of green and perlene violet on the stem, keeping our paint to water ratio very similar, very light. If you don't have perlene violet, you can use any warm red or even brown. And don't forget to add small bits of purple inside the flower bulbs that are just about to open. When you're done with the first layer, the most important thing is to let it dry completely. Now we can work on the second layer and cover only those parts of the flower that contain shadows. So overall, we will cover a lot less surface this time. Our pigments are the same, but this time let's use a little bit less water. And every single pigment I choose is fully transparent, so the first layer of color is still visible as we cover it with the second layer. The technique will be slightly different. Notice that I'm painting the shadow area with the tip of my brush and in some cases I blend it with clear water. In other cases I'm leaving a sharp edge on the shadow. It's not always necessary to have sharp shadows but it does help create areas of focus and separate the part of the flower that's facing the sun from the part that's facing away from the sun. We talked about this so-called edge of light in the grape tutorial and you can revisit it on my channel and also on Patreon. My blue is called Thylo Blue Green Shade. It's one of my favorites from Core, and I'm purposely avoiding ultramarine because although it is a beautiful color that matches this hyacinth flower, the pigment itself is granulating regardless of the brand you choose for ultramarine. And this granulation interferes with glazing color and tends to create texture, which I don't want to see in this case. Granulation will muddy up the glazes and and it's something that you can notice with practice. You may recall last year I did a demo featuring these blue flowers and as I was painting I was trying different combinations of blue and purple and it was during that painting that I realized I'm better off mixing thylo blue with pink to arrive at a certain shade of blue that mirrors ultramarine but doesn't give me that granulating texture. Nothing wrong with granulation of course, it's a wonderful technique when you're not glazing but in this case keeping it transparent is a much better approach. I think this was my biggest and most important discovery in the last few years of watercolor practice. It's interesting how our watercolor techniques
technique and color choices evolve over time. So let me know in comments below what was your biggest learning when it comes to watercolor technique this year. In the meantime, I will add some shadows on the stem and I will move on to the third layer after a bit of a break. And this time, let's only focus on the darkest shadows and most vibrant colors still using the same palette of blue, pink and purple. Notice that the left side of the flower, the one where it gets less sun, is where the darkest shadows are concentrated. But there are still some interesting highlights that remain on that side and it would be great if we can preserve them, painting carefully around with the tip of our brush. The flower looks pretty realistic by now, with three layers, it has some good volume and you can even go a step further and double down on some shadows like I did here. If you've seen any of my previous tutorials, you know that I tend to add a fourth layer very selectively on the darkest parts, but know that at this point your colors will start looking almost opaque. If you like, you can also add some green leaves, but let's keep them super light and not too detailed. We don't want too many layers and we don't want to take the focus away from our beautiful flower. Maybe just one layer with full coverage like I did here. And I'm using primarily hooker's green with some olive green for shadows and some thylo yellow green on the tips. For the sunspots, you can use any of your favorite greens, maybe a splash of yellow on the tips. And after this layer is dry, let's add another layer on top, but just for deep shadows, simply to mark up those areas that are facing away from the sun. A much more simple approach compared to what we did on the flower. And if you want a more decorative look, you can even outline the edges a bit with a thin brush. And my tip here is to only do it on the shadow side to reinforce the direction of light that we were able to capture. That's all for our first watercolor of the spring. Join me on Patreon if you want to follow me in real time and check out this video on advanced glazing technique if you want to learn more about botanical watercolors and watercolor techniques in general. Thank you for watching. I will see you soon.